As we continue here on the Exam Room Podcast, brought to you by the Physicians Committee with the Weight Loss Champion, Chuck Carroll. I'm so excited for our next guest. He is a gentleman who I first became aware of probably 15, maybe 20 years ago now as I first started to follow poker and I'm watching ESPN and, and the World Series of Poker was all the rage at that point. This is a gentleman who is quite successful. You may know him as Kid Poker. I know him as Daniel Negranu, and he is a heck of an advocate for all things plant-based. Daniel, thank you so very much for joining the exam room, my friend. Happy to be on the show. Absolutely. I think that when the typical person who may not be familiar with poker uh, thinks about the stereotypical poker player, they're probably not going to associate that with a vegan. And and so here you are. You Do you feel kind of like an outsider in the poker world because you are eating this healthy, clean diet and an advocate for animals? Well, I want to say first and foremost, there's sort of been an evolution in poker. When you think of the old days, you think of people who are overweight, smoking cigarettes, you know, drinking whiskey with a donut and a chicken wing in their mouth, you know, at the same time. But today, you know, the younger players are much more like health conscious. And a lot of them have adopted a plant based diet or close to it, like a re reducitarian type diet, you know, cutting dairy uh, and whatnot. So that it's definitely been a, a shift. But I, I'm sure like certainly when I first, you know, came into sharing the fact that I was vegan. I was probably the only one in poker, maybe a handful of people that were vegan. And now it's, we're seeing it's a lot more common where people are open to it. And, you know, and I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about maybe the stereotypical player. And I'm assuming, you see, as we tape this, you're just coming off of a marathon match, I believe, against Phil Hellmuth. Um, and, and you guys played a, a high stakes game. How, how long did that one run? Well, we started play at about 5 p.m. and it went till midnight. So we put in about seven hours of play. Uh, in that one. And yeah. And obviously, you know, being vegan and feeling like I got the energy and I've got the dreaded carbs. Oh no. You know, like, <laughs> you know, people are like carbs are the enemy. Don't you dare eat a banana or an apple. That's poison. I mean, I, it's hard to say, like when I think of a nutritionist, if, if I always tell my friends, if a doctor tells you not to eat an apple or a banana, get a new doctor. Yeah. <laughs> that's just pretty nuts. It is. It is insane. And and you knew exactly where I was going with that question too. That's hysterical. So seven hours straight at the table, and I believe I heard on the Switch for Good podcast that you did recently with Dotsy Bausch and Alexandra Paul, who actually connected us here today. Um, you were talking about how players can actually have full meals sent to them during a game. You never really see that on TV. So when you're talking about full meals being sent to the table, are we talking like a full course dinner? Are we talking about a sandwich with a small side? What kind of food are you typically enjoying? Well, me personally, I bring my own, right? Because I want to make sure that it's all healthy. But just as an example from last night, my light went down a little bit. Um, just from last night against Phil Helmuth, he inhaled a large chicken sandwich and then got sushi and dumplings and then had a five pound bag of Sour Patch Kids to wash it all down. So he ate for the duration of the seven hours. I actually didn't, I was, you know, I was good. I was well nourished, you know, I mean, I had enough energy in me, so I didn't need to do that. So, but typically I bring my own stuff, yeah. That, that's a heck of a lot to eat. I mean, and, and I would imagine if you eat that kind, like back in the day when I used to gorge, like at, at my heaviest, I was eating 10,000 calories a day. And I remember when I would eat like that, I would just feel so sluggish and bogged down and really probably wouldn't even be able to concentrate. Even if I'm sitting at a table and playing a card game, do you find that because of your diet, you have this kind of mental clarity? And as you said, you have this energy because you're eating the carbs. Yeah, for sure. So typically in a poker tournament, there's going to be a dinner break. Like it starts at noon and then around 7 p.m. they break for dinner. And then you're going to play about four or five, five more hours after dinner, right? So for me, I make sure like I'm, I'm obviously eating clean and I don't go out to dinner. I don't have drinks. And my opponents often are, you know, having like turkey and, you know, heavy meals and they come back to the table and it's that last three hours right around midnight or one o'clock where I'm sharp, I'm fresh, I feel great, while my opponent's kind of like, you know, they're on their last legs just trying to get through the day. <laughs> what are some of the weirder conversations that you've had with other players at the table? Because if you're starting a game fresh, you're going to have what, like eight, nine, maybe as many as 10 players at a table. So if only one or two players are, are seeing action on a hand, that leaves plenty of time for conversation in between uh, your action there. So what are some of the stranger conversations that you've had as far as other players inquiring about what it is that you're eating? 
I always get asked, you know, because I always see something exotic. Like, what is that? What a joke? <laughs> but it's interesting to me how often the first reaction to whatever I'm eating is, ah, gross. They've never tasted it. They've never tried it. But they're sort of like brainwashed into believing that if it's vegan and it's healthy, ah, it has no taste. I'm like, how do you know? It's like, imagine taking movie reviews or like advice from people who didn't actually watch the movie. Like, oh, I saw this movie the other day. Would you think it was any good? Oh, it was terrible. Did you see it? No. Right. But that's the first reaction. And part of it, I think, is sort of a defense mechanism where people have to feel justified in defense of, you know, hashtag team bacon. You know, it tastes good. And um, it's it's one sort of way in which they can kind of like hold on to that, really, because they don't want to be confronted with it. Because the typical question I go with whenever this comes up, and this is always the one that strikes them. I ask them something like, how old were you when you decided like to eat cows, but not dogs? And they're like, what, what do you mean? I never ate dogs. I mean, yeah, I understand. But like, when did you decide, you know, like cows are food and, you know, dogs are pets. And like, I never made that decision. I mean, it was just, you know, my parents did. I'm like, exactly. Right. So all your dietary, you know, decisions you made, you didn't make any of them. You were indoctrinated by your parents. Now, maybe your parents, you know, are right. Maybe they're wrong. But the point is you never made this decision and you can't really logically explain to me why it's disgusting to eat a puppy, but not a cow, right? In Asian markets, uh, a lot of them, they all, you know, they sell dogs. They have dogs and, they, and people use it for meat. And for me, there's not a big distinction between that and a you know, pig or a cow, except, you know, maybe they're cuter. Is that the reason? But when you get people to realize that they're asleep on this and they never made these decisions and they can't logically put in, well, because cows were, you know, raised to be animals for food. I'm like, well, dogs can be raised to be food too in Asia. Like, you know, it's just, there's no way they can logically, uh, you know, explain it. So that typically at least wakes them up a little bit to go, okay, well, you know, I guess I didn't make these. I, I, what I want to get people to do is like, at some point go, okay, whatever you ate as a child, because I ate meat and potatoes and all that stuff that my parents gave me, whatever you ate as a child, that's based on what your parents thought was good. But you have your own mind now and you can do your own research and you can decide for yourself how you want to live, what you want to eat and the like. Do you find, though, that that kind of puts people on the defensive right away? I mean, that is a heck of a question. I mean, really, you don't know how to answer that. I just think you used bacon as an example. And so, like, Team Bacon, I mean, that is a passionate bunch of individuals. And it seems like no matter how hard you try, you're not going to get them to budge on their opinion of bacon unless you're talking about do you like it crispy or do you like it a little bit more flimsy? But do you find, though, with that approach that there are some people who are just really dug in in the sand and just they won't even consider that, despite the fact that you pose to them a heck of a question? Well, yeah, listen, if somebody goes down the rabbit hole, if it also, and this happens on social media, of, you know, their team bacon because bacon tastes good. What they're essentially saying is, I don't have an argument. I don't have a legitimate justification other than it tastes good because I can go down that road and like, you know, human baby might taste good. Have you ever tried that? You know, it's like, oh, no, that's disgusting. I'm like, okay. Mm. Well, that, and that's obviously a, a different way to take it. But <laughs> what I try to do is when I ask the question, I don't do it in a militant way. I think that's a mistake a lot of vegans make is a lack of compassion and understanding for other people who like, listen, they, they're, they're, you know, it's asleep. They don't, they don't know any better, right? So I take it from a place of like a, a calm, you know, a sort of a calm place where I'm not like, oh, yeah, well, well, what do you, why do you eat uh, cows and not dogs? I'm like, I don't know. It's just, I ask, it's like, so is it, have you ever thought about that? Like, so like why that is, and then they start thinking and you have a conversation with them. You go, hey, listen, I'm not judging you. You eat what you gotta eat. And I think that's more important too for vegans is like to understand that like for the, for the world as a whole, even if people choose to reduce it, meatless Mondays, reduce vegetarian, like I'm good with that. Like I'm obviously, I would love for everybody to be vegan and we stop factory farming and you know move past that, but nothing works that way where it's just like from zero to 60. There has to be gradual steps, and we're seeing more and more, you know, Impossible Burger, Beyond Meats, all these, you know, exotic uh, faux meats and stuff like that are making it easier for people to go, oh, you know, I can have a burger, and it's a little less, you know, I feel a little less guilty about it, or I feel good about what I've done here. So I think we're headed in the right direction. It's just a slow progress, you know, from zero to 60. I think I heard uh, on that Switch for Good podcast, the same podcast, you were talking about how you have an RV uh, when you do these lengthy poker tournaments, like the World Series of Poker, that you'll park outside so that you can always make sure that you have access to a high quality meal. In the conversations that you strike up with people who have asked you about your diet, has any progressed to the point where you invite them onto the RV for dinner so they can try their first plant-based meal? 
Well, I don't typically go that way, but like, you know, you ask one of the questions I get a lot or not questions, but statements from people is you're not getting all, a, a, you're not getting all your nutrients that you need on a vegan diet. You can't because there's stuff you can't get. And secondly, you know, the big lie, which is like, well, you know, you're not getting the protein that you need to build muscle. And I give them one of these. I'm like, I think I'm no Hercules. You know, I'm like, here, you know, <laughs> there's so much evidence and proof that like, you know, you can build muscle on a plant-based diet and many people do. So I kind of explain to them like, well, then what do you eat? And for a lot of people, they're patient with me and I give them sort of the staples, you know, well, for, for protein sources, I, you know, you, I, I take vitamin B12 and vitamin D. So I take some protein powder as well. I just look at it like an, an additional supplement, but I also eat seitan. I eat tofu. I eat tempeh. And those are my main, you know, protein sources. And I'm getting 150 grams a day. So I try to have this conversation, especially with the healthier players at the table, because that's sort of the new norm, you know, and, uh, you know, they have a lot of questions. So like, well, what do you eat if you transition? Because that's the, that's, that's a big reason. I think a lot of people try veganism and then, you know, go away from it because they are missing things. Because they're not, you know, educated on what they need to eat. So I remember when I first went vegetarian years ago, what did that mean? I just ate cheese pizza, you know, like, what am I eating healthy? That's not healthy because I wasn't, you know, educated on it. So a lot of people, and then the people take this extreme, like, oh, I'm going to be a raw foodist or only eat fruit. I'm like, whoa, hold the phone. Okay. (laughs) You can have some processed food. You can have some fun. I had a bag of chips right before this, uh, you know, this thing. It was fantastic. As long as for the most part you know, most of your nutrients are coming from, you know, plant-based whole food diet. Yeah. And I think that you really hit the nail on the head. I do worry personally that we get wrapped up in this all or nothing mentality. Um, Some would even call it an elitist mentality that if you're not eating super clean or completely raw, then you're doing it wrong. And I think that that's really a turnoff uh, for a lot of people who otherwise would entertain the idea of switching to a plant-based diet, because the way that I see it personally and I can't speak for the organization. This is just me personally. There's still a lot of good that comes with eating the the Impossible Burger or Gardein products or something like that, especially when you factor in the environmental and the animal side of eating a vegan diet. Yeah, look, I mean, nobody likes to feel stupid. Nobody likes when somebody is condescending to them. Nobody likes when you say to them, I'm better than you as a human being because of the way that I eat right? You may actually have that belief in your system. You might actually believe that because you're vegan, you're morally superior. Don't make the person feel morally inferior because if you do that, they're going to be on the defense. You're not going to get anywhere with them. They are just going to continue to, you know, push back against anything you say, right? And it's a really, the, and I agree with you so much when, you know, in saying that it's like, it's elitist, right? Um, you know, good for you. You've, you've, you've you know, you've, I, I always, you know, sort of encourage people and they're like, oh, what'd you think of the impossible burger? It was pretty good, huh? I mean, I say, it's, you know, it's not the healthiest thing in the world, but it's, it's a good vegan junk food and probably a little healthier for you than, you know, eating a real burger. And then you start the conversation about other options. I'm like, oh, you know, did you know Oreo cookies are vegan, you know, and things like that. So I think one of the biggest misconceptions a lot of people have is like, they think, you know, when they think vegan, they think, well, they think of all the things they can't eat, right? I can't, you know, oh, I can't eat it. This. I'm like, you're, you, if you reverse it and go, look at all the things you can, you want to look at my diet, my diet, when I'm cutting and I'm actually in, you know, I'm eating I make homemade pizzas, cookies. Uh, what else do I have? I have like, uh, well, that's yummy. I make muffins. <laughs> I make, <laughs> I make like all natural, like really yummy stuff. And well, I can't even think of all the great food that I that I eat recently. But like, so much great stuff. And it's just like um, focusing on what is available rather than what isn't is a nice sort of uh, shift for a lot of people who go. Oh, I mean, I, well, what do, what can you eat? You know, yeah. nothing, we eat pasta every day. Yeah. And, and I think it really is fun to talk to people about that who are willing to listen. And when you run through that list of everything that is surprisingly vegan, it's like, they're like, oh my God, there really is a world of possibilities here. I mean, yeah. When people say to me, it's like, oh, I don't need no vegan food. I'm like, French fries? You, you like French fries? You ever eat French fries? I'm like, oh, I eat French fries. I'm like, okay, well, that's vegan. Mostly. <laughs> I mean, you can make it with, you know, lard and things like that. But like, that's, that's a vegan food. Because that's the thing. It has a stigma and a label. Vegan food. What is vegan food? If you're, unless you're a carnivist or carnivore, you know, eating that ridiculous diet where all you eat is meat, you are eating feet all the time. Are you literally never having a vegetable or a fruit, you know, or anything like that? Like, I mean, yeah. 
Yeah, I think common sense would tell you that you need to eat a well-rounded diet uh, and and eating one that's exclusively meat is just not going to get you where it is that you need to go. I mean, you're stressed from a young age, even when you were looking at that old food pyramid that included uh, a lot of things, you know, meat and dairy and eggs and things like that on there. It was still say what you will about it. It was still a well-rounded diet. So you're getting nutrients from a lot of different sources. And to just focus on one thing, I don't care what it is that you're eating. If you're eating apples all day, you're still not going to get what it is that you need. Yeah, for sure. Like I look at, you know, the carnivism, you know, carnivism and, and the keto diet, for example, which is, you know, a craze thing. And I'm like, okay, well, so I have, I always acknowledge first, I'm like, there's no question that this is these types of diets. If you, you know, eat the right amount of calories or whatever, you can lose weight. Okay. The question is, are these diets healthy long-term, right? If you're 60, 70 pounds overweight and you decide you want to do a keto diet, you can do that vegan as well if you want, by the way. Um, you can lose that weight. But the question is, can this be a lifestyle? Do you see any players in the NBA or the NHL doing keto? No, because their bodies cannot function on that and on that without the carbs. The carbs is what fuels them to play, you know, games every other night, you know, in, in high-intensity situations. So um, I always acknowledge, sure, like, you know, the carnivore, you, the carnivore diet, you see guys, they're ripped, they're muscular, they look fantastic. I'm like, but what, what's the inside look like? You know, often, and this is maybe a little bit graphic, um, what comes out of their, you know, back end is little rocks and pebbles, right? <laughs> there's, there's like no fiber in this diet, right? And a vegan diet is plentiful with fiber. In fact, it's very easy to have too much fiber on a vegan diet, which is another reason I think people, when they first make the switch, they feel bloated, they feel gassy, they're like, oh, you know, they just ate a bunch of broccoli, beans, cauliflower. And I'm like, whoa, hold the phone. That's all fiber. And your body's certainly not used to that. So you want to make sure that you monitor that. But yeah, I mean, anytime you are like excluding necessary nutrients to look good, you know, sure. That, you know, bodybuilders, they do all these weird fat diets, but like, is this something when you're 50 or in your 60s is going to benefit you or is it going to hurt you? And more often than not, if you're, you know, ingesting that much animal fat, I can't imagine that's good for the heart. You talk about that bloat when you're making the transition. What was that process like for you? Was it a smooth one or did you, did you hit a little rough patch there? No, it didn't happen for me. And it, well, part of the reason I think is it was about 2002, I want to say, where I went vegetarian first. I was like, you know what? Meat doesn't sit well with me. I was having the, the rock problem, if you will. <laughs> you know, <laughs> After I would have a flame and yod, next morning, I'm, I'm stuck. So um, I, uh, I just went vegetarian first. So I'm still eating eggs. I was eating cheese. I was eating, you know, butter, milk, those types of things. It, I wasn't like, you know, very conscious about that stuff. And uh, I did that for about eight months to a year. And then I was like, you know what? The more I, you know, realized and read up on dairy, I'm like, this is not good. There's nothing like this is not for me. I am not a baby. I'm not a calf that needs to go from, you know, three pounds to 600 pounds in six months. This is not designed for me. This, this is not for the human body. Uh, and once I had a deeper understanding and learned more about it, you know, my interest in veganism grew, right? Because first, it just came down to health. I wanted to be able to not have the rock issue, right? Yeah. And uh, so we got that handled. And then I learned more, just obviously, I love animals, you know, and I learned more about how, you know, ethical treatment. And then I also realized like, whoa, we were just, this is impossible for our environment. We cannot sustain what's happening to the, you know, lakes and the rivers and, you know, just the pollution and the, and the methane and all that stuff. Like we've got, we've got issues we need to fix soon. And how important do you feel it is for you to talk about those types of concerns and bring that to a wider audience, given the platform that you have? It can be difficult, right? Because then people are going to push back and say, oh, you're a vegan. You know, when you eat your plants, like all these little mice and rodents and bugs, you know, they die too, which, you know, I guess you, you could go down the rabbit hole and you can find a reason to like sort of make an argument against anything, right? Um, has the food I've eaten, you know? come at the hands of some insects and some potential animals? Yeah, I guess so. You know, but I do the best that I can. And uh, again, like I said, I think the most important thing is just not coming from a militant place and acknowledging, yeah, no, I mean, like it's, it's difficult because the, issue, the main issue we face in this world is there's too many people, okay? Yeah. There's just way too many people on earth, right? If we didn't have nearly as many people on earth, and I'm not suggesting like, you know, uh, you know, what do you call it? The Avengers, uh, what's Rag, whatever his name, Ragnaros, whatever. <laughs> I can't even remember the name of like eliminating half the population. That's not what I'm suggesting here whatsoever. But we do have issues we have to deal with one way or the other. And I think in the future, uh, while it's not a perfect, you know, blueprint, the vegan, you know, manufacturing of food is going to have a much 
uh, safer impact on the environment than what we see with, you know, raising, you know, cattle and chickens in, in humanely. And not to mention, I mean, we're, we're in the midst or like we're near the end, hopefully, of a pandemic. Where do these pandemics start? You never see it on a tofu farm. You never <laughs> see it in a soybean factory. It's always, you know, theoretically coming from, you know, these sort of unsanitary, uh, you know, places where animals that are not supposed to be, you know, in each other's grill, if you will, you know, transferring things. And, you know, that's literally where every single one of the pandemics we've had, you know, come from some sort of, you know, manufacturing issue uh, when it comes to animal products. I will say that if there is any silver lining to what it is that the entire world has been going through this past year is that it has forced a lot of us to take a good, long, hard look at our own health. And if you look at the trends as far as where people are, are going as consumers and the foods that they're eating, you are seeing a big boost in, in those plant-based sales. And it, it kind of gets me to think about the young guys who you were talking about at the poker table, but now their parents and, and even in some cases, their grandparents are taking that good, harm, uh, good long, hard look and coming to that same conclusion as well. Yeah, no question about it. You know, the, the business is, the business side of veganism is booming. Like these companies, like at the forefront, obviously Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods. I mean, their stocks, are, you know, skyrocketing, and it appears as though, you know, in the next 10, 20 years, my guess is those two will be at the forefront of supplying a large percentage of, you know, the protein intake for a large percentage of the population. Because again, I don't believe, based on the research I've done, that it's sustainable for another 30, 40 years of us doing what we're doing now. So we have to come up with solutions. And that's one of them. There's another one too. And people always ask me like, would I eat, you know, lab grown meat, you know, which mm. you take some DNA and you make a little Petri dish burger or whatever. And I'm like, I'm for it. You know, I think it's a much better option to just, you know, jab a cow with something and take some DNA and, and make a burger out of it. But I don't have any need for it. Like there's no, I mean, I'm not like, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm for it because I think it'd be beneficial for the world. And I support the companies that are trying to make this a reality on a grander scale. But as far as I'm concerned, like that's not the only reason I, I don't eat meat simply because of the environment and because of analysis. Cause like, I don't think there are properties in there that I need, you know, there's always the B12 argument. Well, where do you get your B12? The same place you do from <laughs> supplements because those animals are, what do you think's in their feed? All of their feed has B12 supplements. They eat it. You eat them. You get the traces of the B12 rather than just taking the B12 directly. Nobody gets enough B12 unless you're taking supplements. You can't. It's just not a thing. It's it's all supplement based. I wonder how even if you haven't been eating meat for so many years, how it would even taste to you if you were to try that lab grown meat. And I just I'm not sure that th my palate would would enjoy that anymore. I really it's don't think it would. That. It's funny you say that because when I when I mean when I ate meat, I'm like the smell of a barbecue, whatever that would be like a good smell. Now when I smell like meat being cooked, or whatever, I'm, it's gross to me. It yeah. actually doesn't smell good. I remember the first time I had an Impossible Burger, and I was like, "Whoa, hold on!" <laughs> you know, I'm like, "You sure you didn't screw me here?" And, and this is because it really does, as far as I remember. I mean, it's been 20 years or so, but as far as I remember, it you know it tastes a lot like meat, which is great again for the transitional phase, but. You're right. Like, I mean, when I smell turkey or I smell, you know, chicken in a microwave or something like that, I have that pungent. I don't know if it smells like death to me or what, but it toxic. Like it does not smell like when I when see when people have takeout food and they order some like Kung Pao chicken or whatever. I smell nastiness, you know, and I don't know if that I, I imagine, obviously, back when I was a meat eater, that wasn't the case. So who knows? I mean, I'm sure, you know, listen, we can't eat, you know, we are omnivores as human beings. So. You know, so we do eat meat, a lot of us, and uh, I'm sure I would like to taste. I'm not denying that. I probably would. But again, there's just no need for me to go down that route because I'm, you know, I'm plentiful in my diet. I get, I'm eating 2,500 calories roughly a day. I'm nourished and I feel great and it's well balanced. And my numbers, when I go to the doctor every six months, he literally uses the term pristine. He's like, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. I'm like, okay, well, I love like, that. Yes, sir. <laughs> I bet you, though, that lab-grown meat, you would still have that rock problem the next morning. I, I really don't see that changing no matter where that meat well, comes Well, yeah, from. not only the rock problem, but one of the other issues with meat is the animal fat, right? Unless you're going to make this lab-grown meat without the fat, which I guess is theoretically possible. But that's what's leading to, you know, heart disease. And that's, you know, the number one killer, uh, you know, of, of all human beings is heart disease. And you just don't see, 
I don't even know the percentages specifically, but I don't know any vegans. I've never heard of a vegan, you know, having heart disease, uh, especially if they've been doing it for quite a long time. So um, it seems like a safe bet that, uh, you know, heart disease is a toothless tiger. And I remember hearing that in one of the documentaries, uh, if you are on a vegan diet, it's not something that's likely to get you. Let's uh, talk a different kind of health. Let's talk brain health. I was talking to a couple of leading neurologists recently, uh, Dean and Aisha Shurzai. Uh, they are plant-based advocates and talk about how it impacts the brain in just such the most profound and beneficial way as far as eliminating meat and dairy from the diet and how it reduces the risk for Alzheimer's. I'm curious, do you feel like you're able to even think more clearly at the poker table after switching your diet? We talked a little bit about about being sluggish earlier, but as far as just mental clarity and able to really hyper-focus in on your opponents at the table, do you feel like you have a leg up there? Yeah. So in my early twenties, I remember feelings late in the evening of just feeling lethargic, feeling drained. And I would end up just drinking green tea or coffee or whatever the case may be to try to stay awake, you know? And then when I made the switch to a vegan diet and I bring little snacks with me, I might bring some nuts or I'll bring some fruit or whatever. Um, my, my clarity was just extended for much longer periods of time. You know, I could focus before, but sometimes I'd wake up with brain fog. And now, you know, throughout the day, I just feel like for the most part, clarity, I don't get, you know, one of the biggest, more, most difficult things to do at a poker table is play while you're sick. If you have a headache or anything like that, I don't experience any of these things. Like a lot of things people complain to me about, I'm like, I empathize, but I don't experience them because, you know, I yeah, just feel really strong, healthy. And yeah, I think mentally, um, also it's a combination. It's not simply eating a vegan diet, right? Being physically fit, you know, and actually going to, you know, going to the gym and working out in, in, in combination with being a vegan makes you uh, a better athlete for one. And I'm not an athlete, but it certainly helps at the poker table. You know, when, my, when I'm physically stronger then my stamina 12 hours in is simply better. No question. And uh, as we kind of wrap up here, uh, you are a Canadian and I have heard that you love hockey. You spend a lot of time on your fantasy hockey lineup. Is this true? It's, I'm like addicted. Yeah. I've been in the same league since 1996 with the same group of 20 guys. And it's, you know, the fun, it's one of the more, the, probably the funnest thing I do. <laughs> do you, do you have any players drafted to your team that you know of who are eating a plant-based diet? I don't actually, I do know some hockey players that were doing it. Mike Zygmanis uh, and a couple others, but I don't know if I have any guys on my team. Oh, you know, I've, I'm trying to, I, I may. I may, but no, I can't think of any right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I could only think of, uh, when I was doing research, I was trying to pull a name before this, and, and I think there were only four individuals that came up. I believe one may even be retired now. Um, and, and it wouldn't surprise me, especially after the release of the Game Changers, if there you know, weren't a few more closet vegans in the NHL that just haven't spoken openly yet about their diet. Yeah. Oh, Zdeno Chara, I think is pretty, he's, he's, yep. uh, he's old, but he's, I, he's like 43 and still going. He's yeah. either plant-based or he's uh pescatarian. That's, I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure he's vegan, but I know he doesn't, he cuts out dairy. Uh, and I think he's predominantly plant-based, but yeah, I think it's one of those topics too, especially hockey. It's sort of the old boys network, you know, vegan, come on, be a real man, have a steak. I get that a lot, you know, real yeah. man. Like, oh, come on, just have a juicy steak. It's like, if I lose at poker, people are like, yeah, that's because you didn't have a nice juicy steak. Eat a steak and maybe you'll win again. Oh, like, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that, that that stigma is shattering slowly but surely. Um, I remember when I was covering the Washington football team here in D.C., uh, speaking with a lineman by the name of Trent Williams. He's now out in San Francisco. This is a big dude, 6'7", 6'8", 350. I mean, just enormous. And he went vegan and um, he started talking openly about it and, and went off of it because he felt like he couldn't keep on enough weight at that size to perform efficiently. Just signed like the biggest contract in the history of any lineman in the NFL this past offseason. So uh, he, he's going back to it after he retires. He's worried about diabetes. But I think that when you look at everything that happened in Tennessee with those Titans players, you look at Trent Williams, you look at some of his other teammates in Washington when, who were eating that plant-based diet and others around the NFL, Tom Brady, primarily vegan. I mean, these are some pretty prominent players that are pushing this message forward and you're doing the same thing in the poker table. So if you and I are having this conversation five, 10 years from now, I really think that we're going to be talking about this can has been kicked a long way down the road. Yeah, no, I think it's already happening. I'm really surprised to hear he thinks that he couldn't 
keep enough size on. Because I mean, if you just have like a cannelli bean shake, you can have a 3000 calorie smoothie if you want it, you know, yeah. it's not difficult. It's really not difficult to get a lot of calories on a vegan diet. Um, so that, that's a little bit surprising, but yeah, you know, seeing more and more athletes through game changers, which I actually, uh, was involved with as a producer. They, they approached me very early on to invest. And I was like, yes, this is a great message. And I think it did a really good job of sort of dispelling a lot of myths that, you know, vegans are scrawny, weak, pale, you know, like emo people. Like we're just, you know, the, the definition of man or doesn't have to be related to meat. But when you watch commercials, you know, Arby's has the meats, blah, 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 blah. I'm like <laughs> they try to convince you that to be, to be a man is like, get over that grill and have a dead cow on there and bleeding and go and just, you know, eat it. Like that's manly. And I just, I don't know. At this point, I just laugh because it's silly. Yeah, I'm going to pull up that one shot. Flex those guns for us one more time. Yeah. Prove them wrong. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I love it so much. Uh, tell us what you have going on right now over at GG Poker. Oh, so ggpoker.com. That's where uh, I play exclusively online. And uh, they're doing a festival this coming up, I think, in a couple of weeks. It's a $150 million guaranteed prize pool, which is $150 million, not $150, $150 million prize pool throughout, which is the largest of all time. Uh, they've already got the Guinness Book of World's record for the largest tournament. They had one, which was $25 million for just one event. This will be a series of events for $150 million total. Um, and it's the software is just awesome. It's like a great playing experience. So if you are an online poker player and enjoy dabbling, uh, you know, GG Poker is the one that you want to play on. All right. Daniel Negreanu, thank you so very much for your time, my friend. This has been uh, a lot of fun for me. And uh, man, I, I got to tell you, th I'm I'm super impressed by by those guns you got, man. Like, are what, what do you just do push ups in between, you know, uh, card games? Like, what 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 is going on there, dude? It's funny. It's all about like cal caloric input and output. When you're trying to gain muscle, you're obviously gonna eat more. I know I burn roughly about 2,300 calories a day. So if I'm trying to cut fat, I eat about 1,800. If I'm trying to gain some muscle, about 2,800. And as far as I just walk 10,000 steps a day on the treadmill with my laptop. And then I work out about four, five days a week just with weights. I'm not doing anything crazy. You know, it's pretty reasonable. It's not all that difficult. Uh, but again, as long as you have a plan and I'm pretty good about sticking to my plan. That's it, man. Well, I appreciate your time very much. Uh, next time I'm in Vegas, I will hit you up and you can give me some of the vegan hotspots. How does that sound? There are so many great spots in Vegas. You will be very impressed with what's available here now. I, I was out there not too long ago. I went to Taco Terry, and I thought that that place oh. was just amazing. That place is mint. It's nearby. We order that sometimes. It's just so good. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a whole other rabbit hole that we could go down, man. So we'll save that for another time. But I appreciate you today. All right. Have a good one. If you feel like you've raised your health IQ by a couple of points, go ahead and subscribe to this channel and leave a nice comment below. And to hear the entire interview, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your shows from and subscribe to the exam room by the Physicians Committee. And please leave a five-star rating.